merged into each other like uh that scene from the gangs in new york <laughs> or something when they when they charge in and they you know and yeah and both sides um you know as had weapons to some extent there were a lot of people who were just using their fists fist fighting there were people with batons bats um we even saw i, I saw a girl myself that had a switchblade this was actually one of the craziest things of the night she had a switchblade that she pulled out and she got knocked out <laughs> Hey there, welcome to Cancel This. I'm your host, Angelo Isidoro, and today we're gonna to be talking about the polarization in the United States, particularly in Washington, D.C., the capital, where we've witnessed over the past few weeks these groups coming together and clashing, such as Antifa, BLM, Proud Boys, and just overall Americans who disagree and don't see eye to eye with each other. We've seen some really incredibly shocking videos uh, of these protests and these riots. They involve looting, uh, fires, destroying buildings, and in some cases, even murder. So for that reason, I want to get a clear picture on what's going on. We don't have a clear picture in the media. Everything is slanted or biased. And I want to speak to someone who's actually on the ground. So we are going to be speaking to Matt Miller, who's our DC bureau chief for the post-millennial. He's on the street, he films these events, and he films some really shocking content, which is valuable and gets millions of views because people want to see what's going on in this country. So with that said, please give our discussion a listen and let me know what you think. All right, Matt Miller, uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. So uh, it's a very tumultuous time in the U.S. at the moment, as you know, and you're our, our D.C. guy. You're in the Capitol. You're in the belly of the beast. I want to know what's really going on because there's a lot of media there's a lot of narrative and you're really right in the middle of it so what is the current atmosphere in washington dc right now yeah so um the atmosphere right now is you know very contentious i don't think that's very special or unusual for dc uh but um you know right now in the aftermath of the election and the confusion and the um the uncertainty you know, between whether who officially won the election, is there ground to stand on with um, the recounts and the, the challenges to to the announced results? Like all that stuff has, um, you know, added up to, to a very tense atmosphere. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, activism, uh, protest. Um, the, you know, the far left and the far right have been very active in recent weeks, um, you know, since the election. So, um, yeah, it, it's tough, <laughs> you know, it's tough in DC, uh, but this is the place where, you know, politics usually boils down, um, to, to, you know, a very high tense environment out in the streets and, and that sort of thing. Well, and you've been covering that. I mean, some of the videos you've posted, uh, and for those of you who don't know, Matt's been out on the street filming some of the protests that are happening. Uh, and man, you got a lot uh, bigger balls than I do to be in the middle of these situations where people are just beating the shit out of each other. Uh, is this something that you think, well, first of all, I'll ask, are these protests and borderline riots, have you seen anything like that before in D.C.? And do you think they're going to stay? So uh, in D.C., you know, since the worst uh, era of these riots that I've seen in D.C., I've seen protests here and there. There's been a lot of like dicey um, clashes before that I've seen in the last couple of years. But um, since the George Floyd killing and, and the riots that spurred off after that, it's just been a whole new level of um, of, of protests, you know, where any, any day that there is some kind of gathering, there's potential for violence. Um Whereas before, nine times out of 10, the police, you know, you'd be able to trust the police would be able to keep things civil, keep things um, separated and, and peaceful. Uh, but now it's, it's almost like you never know. It, you know, there's a strip down by the White House uh, that they've renamed Black Lives Matter Plaza. And it, it's kind of like at the point where if you want to go get some footage and, and you want to see um, some action, any given day that you go down there um, in the evening time, there's usually protest, um, you know, seven days a week. You, you know, you could usually count on them being, you know, being, being down there at some, um, in some capacity, right? And you're going to see something happen, you know, whether it's a fist fight, whether it's people, you know, screaming at police or, 
um, anything like that. It's always going on down here, especially in that area and other areas. Um, so yeah, since the George Floyd, the, the night that George Floyd um, died, and the riots that followed that, it's been, it's been terrible. It's been very, very uh, intense. Mm -hmm. And would you say, I mean, we don't know what the future holds. Twenty twenty has been a really weird time. We aren't even entirely sure who's president. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that there is going to be a change, and that it is Biden. Do you foresee? this sort of new norm of just having protests and riots, is that going to go away? Is that sort of the energy that you're getting right now, that these things are just something that existed during the Trump era and now we're going to go back to the old Obama days where everyone was, uh, was hunky-dory? Well, that's something I think uh, it could go either way. You know, I guess you could make a fair assessment and say, all right, Trump's, if he's out, then there isn't really like this antagonizing presence to the far left and these these activists that um, were making sport out of coming out, uh, you know, every week and, and being extremely active, protesting Trump, um, getting in, enraged by his rhetoric. And there was a lot of material for them to work with as far as protest and, and organizing. There's a lot of negative energy there for them to tap into and get these big crowds. Um, now it's going to be a matter of, you know, are those people going to subside and, and, and chill out now that Biden's president? We've kind of got back to a more status quo in D.C. Or is there now not going to be a force uh, to counter the left and, and their um, and their activism and, and their protest? Whereas, you know, Trump would try to do what he could um, to take a hard stance against rioting, rioting looting um, and, you know, get the law enforcement involved. Uh, and be a proponent of a strong law enforcement stance um, against these acts of, of violence. Um, I don't know if we can trust Joe Biden to do that kind of thing. I don't know if he's really going to be a hard pro law enforcement person that's going to really have the have the balls to stand up to the far left and their their shenanigans and their violence. So. Um, it, it all depends if the far left, if they want to take advantage, they, they might have an opportunity here to take advantage of a softer uh, presidency, you know, that's not really going to um, confront them the way that Trump did. Although, I mean, you know, it was it was terrible un under Trump, too. Like, you know, you know, there was a problem there where because of Trump and what he um, what he stood for, there was negative energy. I, I don't know if it will really make a difference in the end. You know, there's an opportunity for them to kind of run rampant right now if it is Biden that won. Um so we'll have to see. Well, and it's interesting because I think Biden is in a really difficult position and we've already seen a result where AOC plus three and the progressive wing of the Democrats are somewhat upset and demoralized that Biden and the Democrats are seeming to reject the defunding the police narrative, which hurt them greatly in the election. And they're sort of, you know, shifting a little right on a few issues. So I think it's going to be interesting to see you know, if if another tragedy happens, if someone, you know, if if a cop shoots a black guy and it becomes a huge thing and and it's another tragic event, what is Biden going to do? Because if he if he jumps on the bandwagon of the defund the police movement, the whole country hates that. But if he doesn't do that, the progressive wing is going to be mad at him. So, do you think in in that sense, would it be similar to the days of Obama when Michael Brown died, and there was protests? at that time or are we in this totally new territory now where maybe it's going to get worse well i do think uh things have changed since obama i think the far left has become very emboldened um we've seen more antifa black lives matter and um and militant activist groups than ever um in the last couple years since obama so i think uh it might be a new ball game um, and without that counterforce to to kind of be to stand against um, violence and violent protests, riots, uh, they might they might have free reign to do more um, in those situations. Because I don't think that will their reaction to those situations of, of um, you know the shooting of black people, or, you know um, police shootings and stuff like that. I don't think their reaction will change to that necessarily. It's just going to be the president's reaction changing. Um, being softer and maybe not uh, 
being as likely to call in uh, the National Guard or, or not, not, the, uh, not the National Guard, but call in the troops and to stand behind police officers um, that are you know, doing their job. Uh, so, so again, yeah, we'll have to see. I, I don't think, um, I, I don't really know. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, they're very sporadic and it's kind of like a quickly evolving elements in politics right now is this emboldened left wing uh, radical uh, group. So, mm -hmm. and, and in terms of things that are changing, I mean, you mentioned Antifa, there is more Antifa, but on the flip side, you have more conservatives or more right leaning individuals who are becoming more active and you do see these groups now coming out. Um, I mean, you covered the, I think at least one of the titles of it was the Million MAGA March, where you had a ton of Trump supporters um, coalesce in the Capitol. Um, and that was sort of a crazy day. And that was the day when you got all that footage where, and correct me if I'm wrong on, on the timeline, as people began dispersing and going home to their hotels, that's when activists of the opposing side came out and there was some violence and issues. And I mean, could you just recap that day for us? Yeah. So, you know, I, I attended uh, the Million MAGA March during the day. It was very peaceful. You know, everybody was pretty chill, happy. They were doing their thing. Um, they marched up Constitution Ave, I believe it was, all the way to the Supreme Court. And there was our first encounter with Antifa. There was a group waiting up there um, of about 200 Antifa, I'd say, that the police had already kind of sectioned off away from the Trump supporters. And remember, there's thousands of Trump supporters. There was maybe, you know, over 100, 100 to 200 Antifa that showed up. Um, they had shields. There were riot police already there. And this was around, you know, like two o'clock. So this is the middle of the day. And there was a lot of, you know, posturing and, and shouting at each other. There was, but there wasn't really any violence that I saw. There was a, one incident where um, there was a scuffle I saw where one Antifa guy, I guess, kind of got separated and, and he kind of got surrounded uh, or, or just kind of like heckled. But um, what really, yeah, the, the real violence happened later that night as people started to disperse and head back down uh, toward Freedom Plaza, toward the White House, where their hotels were and the restaurants in the downtown area. Um, we saw just kind of like this eruption of violent brawls, just like popping off across the city. I captured several of them, uh, myself, just like on my walk back, um, from the Supreme court. And yeah, so we would have people, I saw one for instance, where it was three guys with an American flag, uh, sitting on the patio of a restaurant and a, a guy, uh, came up and took their flag <laughs> and it created like this whole street fight. It was crazy just kind of like, you know, stirred up. He took the flag from the patio. He was just walking down the street. The, the guys got up and, uh, it was, you know, a big fist fight and they were hitting each other with the flag. It was crazy. Um, much later that night, you know, there were groups of Proud Boys um, that were kind of, because there was a lot of attacks on Trump supporters. We saw on Twitter, there were some big uh, clips like women and children getting accosted by Antifa earlier in the day. So I think what happened was the Proud Boys and some um, some of, some of the other Trump supporters felt uh, like possibly there needed to be some retribution or whatever. Like they, it kind of seemed like they were all gathering together and they were kind of roaming the streets um, to see if Antifa wanted to come out and uh, and have like an altercation with them. Um, it was pretty clear to me that uh, both sides I think were looking to encounter each other. So there was a period you know later into the night where. I was following around a group of the Trump supporters and I just wanted to see where they would go, how, how it would kind of uh, turn out. And it was very interesting because it was kind of like a game of chess with, the, you know, for between Antifa and the Proud Boys with the whole city and with, and the police were in the middle or they were trying to be in the middle. So you would have the Proud Boys, they're, they're roaming the city blocks, they're looking for Antifa. <laughs> the police are trying to, to set up like barricades in the middle between them. But there was a couple instances, at least two that I remember, where the police were too slow. They were about two or three minutes too too slow from you know setting up their line or whatever, and there were full on clashes. There was one uh, instance that I captured where the Proud Boys and Antifa charged into each other, like uh, that scene from the Gangs in New York <laughs> or something, when they when they charge in and they you know and yeah, and both sides um, you know had weapons to some extent. There were a lot of people who were just using their fists, fist fighting. 
There were people with batons, bats. Um, we even saw, I saw a girl myself that had a switchblade. This was actually one of the craziest things of the night. She had a switchblade that she pulled out and she got knocked out by one of the Proud Boys or the Trump supporters. And then they took the knife and brought it back to the police officer. Um, and I, yeah, there were people pepper spraying each other. It was like some of the craziest stuff I'd ever seen in this city. Um, so yeah, and that, that went on all night till like about midnight. And then... Uh, well, you know, I, I chuckled when you mentioned gangs in New York, because as you're describing this, all, everything going in my head was, God, this sounds like gangs in New York, where it, it, it's like so absurd. It also reminds me of the Warriors, where you have these groups, like it sounds very absurd to people who aren't plugged into this, like you and me and, and people in our circles where we're so used to, yeah, the Proud Boys are coming down, you know, 2nd Avenue and Antifa are going to meet them there and they're going to have a big battle. It's like this isn't normal at all to have basically political gangs um and it, it's interesting because they are gangs but they're not you know if you compare them to gangs in, in compton or traditional gangs where they're actually murdering each other it is less violent but i think it's more shocking and that's what you're describing is is the the visuals of it is a lot more shocking because I mean, I, I saw some of the videos where there was a little girl that was pushed over. There was an old elderly man who was beaten. Um, there was that, that video of the woman who was knocked out by one of the Proud Boys. I mean, these are scenes that are very visually frightening and exhilarating and confusing. And it's crazy to think that it's all over ideology. You know, it, it's interesting that you were in the middle of it as an observer, as a neutral observer, and what you filmed is very seldom shown anywhere. I mean, that evening I was flipping through TV and looking at every channel and they weren't really covering this. And that seems really crazy to me, that aspect of it, where what you filmed got millions of views on Twitter, it became this huge thing for the post-millennial in our outlet, and it wasn't covered anywhere else. And this was basically a mass gang war. I mean, what are your thoughts on that in terms of the mainstream media not exactly covering this side, regardless of whether it's from a right-wing or a left-wing perspective? It's just not talked about at all. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, I, quickly, just, uh, you know, mention the Warriors. I did hear at least a couple times that night uh, some of the Proud Boys saying, Antifa, come out and play. <laughs> it was hilarious. But, uh, but yeah, like, that's the reality is, like, it was me and I'd say maybe four or five other independent journalists that I know that, you know, we, we kind of see each other out there a lot when we're covering these kinds of things. And they uh, some of them even travel around the country to, to make it to these clashes, um, you know, whenever they think they're going to happen, whenever they're going to pop off. But, yeah, I mean, CNN is not out there. Fox News isn't out there. Uh, the big outlets and um, I, they're not they don't have people on the grounds covering it. I don't know if they're interested in. Um, in really showing that what's going on, um, you know, showing that side of the story or showing kind of the, the, uh, the part two of that day. Um, I don't know how well it was actually covered in the mainstream media. There were several outlets that reached out to me, uh, to get access to my footage or they wanted to use my footage. Um, you know, bigger outlets that, that did, I guess they did cover it in some capacity. Um, but yeah, you know, you don't see field reporters out there. Um, and, and you know, that night, what was different about it is, you know, I was staying with the Trump supporters who, um, for whatever reason, I don't feel <laughs> threatened out there by them, right? So, like, I can walk around, I can film them. They're not going to attack me. They're not going to try to, you know, uh, beat me up or anything. They didn't really mind that I was a journalist out there walking next to them. Uh, so, so that was what it was. But usually what it is is me trying to go undercover into just an Antifa protest. So like with the George Floyd um, protest the, several nights after that happened, the whole downtown area was full of rioters, Black Lives Matter, Antifa. So you're kind of behind enemy, enemy lines, I guess, and you're trying to get footage of what's going on, you know, just like what, what is really the scene that's going on there. And I don't think that um, the bigger outlets, the, the corporate outlets necessarily are getting that kind of footage um, themselves. I don't know if they if they don't have an interest in doing that. They think it's too risky. Uh, regardless of the risk, I, I think that that is that's imperative to get. Somebody needs to get that story. Uh, what is happening in the depths of these Antifa and and um, 
Black Lives Matter protests, what's really being said? Is there violence going on? Are there fights? Are there are they threatening people? Uh, are they threatening journalists? You know, I always say that um, when we're out there undercover or whatever, and we're trying to just get footage, I think, you know, it almost seems like they are hunting us. They're hunting the journalists. I would even say that uh, <laughs> these guys hate journalists as much as they hate the cops a lot of times, you know, and, and I've seen, I've seen, jur- well, I mean, I've, I've seen journalists get brutalized and I mean, it, it's kind of evident the threat that we pose to them, right? So like if they do something, if they smash into a restaurant and they try to light it on fire or they, they let a uh, uh, trash can on fire and they throw it through the bank window or something, which I've seen both of those things happen and I've recorded um, and we get them doing it and we can get like a glimpse of their face or that what they were wearing or whatever people have gotten arrested because of the footage that um me and other journalists have gotten out there it's actually had ramifications people have you know justice has been served because of the footage that we've gotten um and that poses a huge threat to them they hate that they hate the idea that they're being recorded so there's actually like they're very systematic about it sometimes sometimes it's safer than others they, they won't there won't be as much of an effort to root out journalists but especially on especially violent nights or nights that there's big organization. I've even uh, encountered where they'll say everybody who's media come over to like this corner or this side of the street. We're going to ID check you to make sure you're from approved of outlets. And, um, you know, if you have a camera, if you look like media, if we catch you recording with your phone, because they don't even want, you know, even if you point your phone, you know, down the street, they'll, they'll notice that there's people watching for that. And what they did, I think one night I remember is they gave people an orange wristband or like something like that to, to verify that they were approved of journalists. If you were, you know, maybe if you were perceived of being a right wing journalist or you were a conservative ideology or whatever, um, then I don't know what would have happened to you. But um, I've seen them brutalize people who they deem not um, ideologically congruent with. So, um, yeah, I mean... It, it's tough. I can definitely see why journalists wouldn't want to put themselves in that situation. Uh, but I think the story is just necessary to get out. Well, it's a very Soviet mentality of approving certain journalists that they're okay with and, and potentially brutalizing ones that they're not. Are you, have you ever felt unsafe or have you personally ever been in a position where you're like, I don't know if this is worth it. Uh, Cause you, you've, you get right in the middle of it. Have you ever felt that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had, I've had several close calls, um, but I think it has to do, you know, when I started doing it, I had a lot of my close calls when I first started. I think after getting repetitions, going out there, knowing what is going to draw attention to yourself and what isn't, um, and then getting that instinct for like, okay, something's going to pop off um, and, and kind of knowing like, okay, is this safe? Can I get it? Or... Am I, you know, it's just going to be, do I need to start walking back toward the police or get myself out of here? You know, you kind of get like a sense for it after you do it um, enough times. I've had a couple instances, like one of my first nights out, I think it was the third night of the George Floyd riots in uh, downtown DC. I had uh, somebody come up to me and say, um, this is when the looting was going on. I think this is like one o'clock in the morning, very late at night. And they were breaking into a restaurant. Um, so, you know, smashing the windows, they were like, you know, uh, turning the tables over and stuff and, and stealing whatever. And, um, I had somebody, you know, we were getting footage of it and this is when I was working for the daily caller and the guy comes up to me and says, Hey, I know that you work for the daily caller. I know who you are. You can leave right now or I'm going to tell everybody who you are. And this was actually a day or two after we saw, um, a Fox news reporter get chased down the street, uh, and they had been anybody that had like a camera at this point, we'd seen people were getting punched. They were getting their cameras smashed. Um, so we knew we wanted to be very inconspicuous and, and careful and not identify ourselves in media as media in any way. Um, so this guy came up to me. He said that. And I said, you know, like, what are you threatening me? Like, I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. And I just kind of, you know, walked away. And then he did call out. He's like, oh, right wing fascist guy over here, you know, Fox News fascist or something. And then I got surrounded by about 15 or 20 guys and they were throwing stuff at me, throwing rocks and bottles and stuff. And they said they were going to like, I don't know if I could swear, you know, I was going to, they were going to F me up and like kill me, you know, whatever. Um, 
And yeah, so, you know, I basically just booked it down the street. Like I, I there was no other, they were kind of like starting to surround me and like corner me against the wall. I was able to book it. I ran like all the way from <laughs> the White House to DuPont Circle, basically like six blocks. They were following me for a while, but then they just kind of gave up. Um, that was like my first close call when this stuff like really, really popped off. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I had to take a couple of nights off after that. I'm like, this is, you know, is this worth it? Uh, but then I decided, you know, um, there's just not enough coverage of this. And I think this is something that I can get better at. This is something I can learn how to do safely and, and to avoid situations like that. Um, you know, concealing yourself and just kind of being aware of your surroundings. Um, it's never going to be hundred percent safe. Obviously it's risky, but that could always happen at any point. And that kind of thing has happened a couple times to me, but, um, less and less more recently. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, man, I said it once, I'll say it again. You got bigger balls than I, and, uh, <laughs> and you're doing good work out there and we're, we're happy to have you on the post millennial team. So just to finish it off, where can people follow you? Yeah, uh, my Twitter is at MattMiller757. And yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's probably the best place. That's the best place. All right, Matt Miller, thank you so much for coming on. All right, thank you. That was Matt Miller. He's our DC Bureau Chief here at the Post Millennial. Let me know what you thought about our conversation. I thought it was really insightful into what's going on with these protests and what's going on in the capital of the United States. Um, please make sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube and like and share. And please make sure to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts where you can listen to an audio version of these discussions. Until next time, thank you.